So I'm Bex from Social Media Executive and today we're going to be talking about how we can basically generate more sales through social media and avoid the brain trap. And this is what Mike is an absolute specialist on this. He's been working for over 30 years in this sector and he's going to be sharing lots of tips and advice on how to do this. So welcome, Mike. Do you want to give yourself a bit of an introduction? Hiya, Bex. I don't think I can top that introduction, to be honest. I'm always <laughs> amazed when people, you know, when you go, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years, but in here, I'm like 20 years old. And I think, well, how does that square off? But obviously, I'm not 20 That's years fair. old. Yeah, sorry, I haven't made you feel old today. <laughs> <laughs> I, start, I started when I was six. And, yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, well, I really enjoy sales. And uh, yeah, I've been involved in selling for a long time. Started my sales career, if you would call it that, on uh, Berry Market because I'm a Lancashire oh. lad. And the, uh, my very first job, Saturday job, selling fishing tackle on Berry Market. Yeah. I'm very lucky because I learned from uh, work from my brother in law who had no sales training at all, but was so good at sales. And it was only years later when I started to get into um, research. Oh, so of course, frozen, from mate. a brain perspective, and I was able to reflect on what brother in law John was doing and how good he was. Yeah, so. um, and, we're, and we're loving this now because you've you froze for a little bit there, Mike. So you were talking, yeah, and your mouth was closed, it was amazing. It right, I'm a ventriloquist, mouth. that's what it is. So, <laughs> yeah. what I was saying was, um, so, so learning from my brother in law, watching somebody who'd had no sales training but intuitively he was very good at, at selling. And it was yeah. years later when I started to delve into it that I realised what John had been doing and what made him so good at it. And uh, and that's how I kind of stumbled into this thing called neuroeconomics. So, yeah, so what uh, is neuroeconomics? Because I know we've chatted about it in the past and I kind of understand yeah. it a bit more now. But I think for a lot of people watching, they'll be like, what is neuroeconomics? Yeah, so neuroeconomics is, is the most advanced stage for um, understanding why people do what they do. And, and it's a combination of three areas. So it's economics. Uh, I took my original degree in economics, okay. but and it was always dissatisfying because it never it never genuinely explains why people do what they do. Yeah. So I took a degree in economics, which I enjoyed, but you kind of realise the, the the limitations of its application. Uh, but then I started to read psychology. So I've been reading psychology for about 25, 30 years. Um, and again, you could see where it was going with it, but never properly explained what was going on. And then just by chance, about 10 years ago, I was talking to a doctor of psychology. Now, we were talking about adult human behavior. And I was saying, you know, I find it a fascinating area, but, but psychology isn't answering the questions I've got. And he said, we're having a cup of tea. And he said, you really need to get into neuroeconomics. And I'd never okay. heard that word up until then. So like a good academic, he just sent me away. So... I ended up doing a, a, a course through uh, an international university and economic and neuroeconomics is economics plus psychology plus brain biology. So it's oh, not wow. just it's not just the theory of why people do things. You're able to get into, uh, well, what's actually going on in the brain um, and whether it's using MRI, scanning and imagery or whether it's actually through understanding if, if, an, if a part of the brain is damaged or removed what does that cause to happen? What changes happen as a result to behavior? Now, when you take all of that, what you're able to do with a with a with uh, an appreciation of, for example, how do adults make decisions? Um, and when you appreciate that, what you can do is you can say, how do we apply this to selling? What are some of the adjustments we make? Because what we're doing really is, it's, it, whether it's B2C or B2B, it's this brain here having a conversation with this brain over here. But, and it's really, but once you understand what's going on with brains, you can do something about it. And it's really interesting, isn't it? I shared a post last week, and it was actually Dave Bradburn, who's a branding specialist. And I shared a post that, that he'd shared in one of his presentations I'd been to. And it said something like, you will read this first. And it had bold, big writing. Then you will read this in small writing. Then you will read this bit at the bottom. And then at the top in tiny writing, it said, you will leave, read this last, even though that yeah. was at the top. And I suppose, and everyone who basically saw it said, "My, I did exactly the same." I'm thinking, yeah. Ultimately, our brains all work the same way, don't they? There's a lot of commonality, 
yeah. and it's cross culture as well. So in some in some aspects, what's happening there is um, because we are taught to read in this culture, we're taught to read in a certain way. Um, but but the, well, on the back of studying neuroeconomics for the first three years, I then created a, a model of adult human behaviour, which which has been independently verified as uh, accurately explaining how, as adults, we how and why we behave the way we do, and then how you can edit either as a coach or a sales leader or as a seller who wants to take responsibility for their own behavior. Uh, and businesses all over the world use it because it's it's not a cultural thing, it's a brain thing. And yeah. then you can apply it to any sector as well. So it's, um, yeah, I, I find it fascinating. I could bore people for hours on this <laughs> we could talk forever. Fortunately, people pay me to bore them for this. For <laughs> yeah. So we've got 10 minutes. So right, if as small businesses, you yeah. know, or people who are marketing and doing social media in, in for their, you know, on behalf of their companies. How can we use this? Because I know sales can be a massive kind of brick wall sometimes. I mean, I struggle mm. sometimes, you know, giving, giving, getting the balance right on your social media. You either give it too much sales and everybody switches off or you don't give it enough sales and you just give all your value away. Yeah. Um, so, again, you know, Give us some tips then on how this sort of neuroeconomics can help with our social media. Yeah. Well, the, the first thing to to simplify all sales. So every sale that has ever been made and will ever be made is on the principle of somebody is in a, a now situation and there is a new situation and they either want to get away from the now into the new or they just want to get towards the new. So, so every sale ever made is based on the premise of customer is in a now position and they want to be in the new position. And social media has a, a huge part to play in helping people to understand how you get from that now to new. The way we communicate with each other as we're doing now is we speak and with social media, whether there's video or whether it's just written text with or without images, imagery, it's what is the language pattern that we use? And we all have a... Um, a favoured language pattern. And there's a brilliant book by a French Canadian lady called Shelley Rose Chave called Words That Change Minds that delves into this. But I'll give two examples. We have our preferred way of uh, writing and speaking. And that will come through in the social media that we use. Most of us will stick to just one preferred way. And that works for us. And that's great if that is also the preferred way that our customers like to speak. But statistically speaking, for every one person that you're talking to who shows your language pattern, there is another person who doesn't show your language pattern. Mm -hmm. So the first tip I'm going to give will double your sales. So whatever your sales are now, if you apply this one, it will instantly double them. And it's best to give it with an example of uh, two random sectors. So we'll go with uh, a holiday company. So if you're a travel agent or you're involved with holidays, um, you can describe the holiday. You could sell it on social media in, in two ways. What I recommend is that you use both of them. One of them is if you're selling a holiday, you're selling it because you are encouraging people who want to go to new places and have new experiences. And for, for some of the people watching this, they'll resonate and they'll nod and go, yeah, that's why I go on holiday, because I like to go to new places and enjoy new experiences. For every person who does that, there is also somebody who likes to get away from it all. Now, the, okay. the destination is the same. The yeah. hotel in the same resort on the same island in the same place will be exactly the same. But the reason for going to that place will either be because I want to go to a new place for a new experience or I want to get away from it all. Yeah. So they've got two we, different reasons for going. And on mm. social media, if you were selling that hotel and that resort and all the rest of it, you, you need to put both in because... Yeah. For everyone who does it for one, there is someone who does it for the other. A, a second example, and, and this feels very um, personal for me, this one, is uh, as someone who's currently put himself on a diet and wants to lose some weight, <laughs> if, if you're running a gym or exercise classes, then you think, well, why would people want to do exercise classes or a gym or, or Weight Watchers or whatever it might be? It's some people, frankly, just want to lose weight. Yeah. And other people want to get in shape. And you yeah. might think, well, they're the same thing. But the language pattern is different. One is getting away from a current situation. And one is getting to a new 
situation oh, okay. i want to get in shape i want to be able to fit in my skinny jeans i want to yeah. be able to wear this shirt again and look good the other one is it could be i want to lose weight or it could be i don't want to have the health conditions that i know i'm at risk of of inheriting so there are two there are two messages there and whoever's writing the post or putting the social media content together the clever content writer will bring them both together because they'll appreciate that you're selling you're selling it for those who want to cause something to happen and those who want to prevent something from happening okay so and the clever really, content has to have both in yeah because if you put it in one way like i want to lose weight it's not necessarily going to appeal to the person who wants to get fit exactly it's a completely different driver isn't it exactly the underlying the yeah. primary and secondary motivators are, are different it's how we express them so we've got a quick question then mike someone's asked yeah. how would a coach apply this to coaching services yeah well and i can Great speak question. as a as a coach so so if we do it for coaching services if we do it for business coaching some people will want to uh, grow the business yeah. and some people will want to be able to um, commit less time to their business but still get uh, the results that they're after so so the positioning is for those who want to grow business they want to expand um, you want to get a better return on the hours that you're putting in all of that is what's called a towards language pattern and the other the other the balance of it is um, you want to do these things you want to grow your business but you don't want to lose time with your family for example you want to grow your business but you want to avoid working 120 hours a week. And that sentence has got both language patterns stitched together in it. Okay, I see. So the language is so important. And we see this all the time, don't we, on social media? Because, yeah. you know, we often focus on the products and the services we've got rather than the outcomes that can yes. achieve, can't it? Yeah, exa exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so tip then, number one. So tip, tip number one. one right language for your target audience and yeah. balance it so it's for those who want to cause something to happen and prevent other things from happening the second one is um understanding that through the social media if you want somebody to buy something you're asking them to make a decision mm. the decision making process in the brain is is very complicated but the fortunate thing is we know what the gateway is and the gateway is a bit of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex which lives in the prefrontal cortex bit just across here um so, so the orbital frontal cortex is the gateway to decision making and uh, uh, the the short the short version of this is you need to put somebody in a positive frame of mind Oh, okay. so, so if you think from an emoji point of view you just want the smiley face when yeah. somebody's when somebody's in a positive frame of mind they are much more likely to buy and they are much more likely to buy more and they are much more likely to be adventurous now you compare that with somebody who's in a bad frame of mind or, or you know somebody who's really fed up or whatever it might be and yeah. you try to sell to them when they're in uh, a poor frame of mind or a negative frame of mind then they are much more, if they do buy they're much more likely to have buyer's remorse so that's not really interesting like, isn't it? yeah yeah that's really interesting because i know um people with with bipolar you know when they're on a high they spend 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 because they feel mm. so amazing and so good don't they exactly yeah so, so i guess the question is so how do you how do you put someone in a positive frame of mind through social media uh, and the all of our senses are linked through ultimately to this to the decision making gateway so all of our senses are, are feeding through into the orbital frontal cortex which um, which leads to a decision to be made or not and the main one of course will be uh, the visual which yeah. is, which is also the main one it's the the hungriest it takes up so much of our uh, uh, capacity and it takes up a lot of the um the frequency that we can take and the the sheer amount of information that we're taking is through is through the site so there's there's a couple of things the visual stimuli has got a hugely powerful impact uh, on the decision making process and there are some very simple things that you can do uh, one is use the highest quality imagery that you can use videos capture our imagination and they capture our attention much better than a still image and i'm sure you've discussed this before yeah like we but are there now. Is an, yeah smile 
the, uh, infographics and anything yeah. where you're going to use um, colours. So there was there is some evidence in the Journal of Experimental Psychology where they looked at um, the psychology of colour and how some colours are more trustworthy. So, for example, a dark blue, a dark blue yeah. is is seen to be uh, a more trusted colour across the spectrum than other colours. But oh. it's also about what about the contrast? So how easily how easy do we make it to to actually see the thing? Uh, and it's not just about font size; it's also then the font that we use. You see, some people use a, a font, and it's actually quite difficult to read. And it and, it, and again, there's loads of uh, research in this, and they'll say, "Well, we can show you the same text, and we put it in this font, which is difficult to read, and this one that's easy." Oddly enough, the brain will go, "I'll, I'll take the easy one, thanks yeah. very much." Yeah. And it's not, and it's not because it is easy; it's because we perceive it to be easier. Yeah. So if you're presented with uh, two businesses on social media that are, that are selling the same product or service, the site that looks like it's it's both easier to understand and it's easier to deal with, that is the one that will go with more of the time. It's not that it necessarily is the easiest one. It's just we perceive it to be the easiest one to use. Right. So so it's is it uncluttered? Is it clear? Are the colours engaging? Um, is the font easy to read? Yeah. Does it have everything about it that says this is going to this is going to be easy to use? Yeah, and it's going to give you a positive experience. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's a couple of other bits that link with that, and one is um, the length of the text. And again, there's research around this. It suggests that the average literacy age in the UK is a, is somewhere between nine and eleven years old. Yeah, which which means that um, you need to keep the, the length of sentence and the words in the sentence as short as possible. And around about eight words in a sentence is kind of the sweet spot. Once okay. you get into the long sentences, we're much less likely to understand what it's about. So short and words, short sentences. Short words, short sentences. And someone's asked, what's the best font type and size? Can yeah, just anything that is, um, because you're not controlling the end user and the, the scale that they've got their screen on. So, so yeah. when I go onto a PC, I reduce it down to about eighty percent anyway. But it's more about what's the contrast and what's the the, the legibility of that font. So, I'm, whilst I'm not a font expert, what yeah. I can say is, if it's easy to use, there's a reason why uh, Arial and and Calibri are kind of the, the the default settings is because for the eye, they're easy to read. Yeah, yeah. So, so the contrast and whether you're using. So, if I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation, which I don't do that often. I wouldn't normally do black on white. I would do white on black just because it's easier for us to see. And in oh. fact, I probably wouldn't use black. What I probably use is a very dark gray because it's easier on the eye. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? I really yeah. struggle to read white on black. I think it's because I've got astigmatism in one of my eyes. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It is interesting. So we've got right language for your target audience, balance it off. We've got yeah. the second one, which is engage the orbital frontal cortex, which is the decision making. Yeah. part of the brain and the third one is pricing and options and i'm going to go back to my economics route and talk oh, yeah. about the economist magazine so this is there's a brilliant ted talk on this by uh, professor dan arily who did a uh, he did a ted talk back in 2009 and okay. um he, he noticed that the economist magazine had put a, an offer out for the annual subscription and there were three options to it you could get the online version and that for a year, that was $59. Right. You could get the print only, so the magazine dropping through your letterbox, that would be $125. Yeah. And you could do print and online for $125. So three options, online only $59, print only $125. And the third one was to combine the print and online together for $125. For the same price. Prof Professor Dan's looking at going, this don't make any sense. They've surely made a mistake here. So he, he did a he did a study with a hundred MIT students. So kind of the target audience for for yeah. the economist. Uh, yeah. And he asked not MIT, the sorry, MIT, I think. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Tech. Okay. Yeah. So it's a it's a high profile uni. Yeah. So 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 the students there would fall into the demographic who who they want to sell to. Um, and he asked the hundred students. He says, so given these three options, which one would you buy? 16% said they would buy the online only option, the $59. Yeah. Nobody wanted the print only. 
nobody at all. And 84% went for the print and the online together. So I thought, well, that's interesting. If nobody wants this middle one, why don't we just take it away? So we took it away. So now there's online only for $59 and print and online together for $125. Another yeah. 100 students, which one would you go for? 68% now wanted the online only. So it went yeah. from 16%, so the minority, up to 68%, and 32% wanted the print and the online one. So, so, so on the face of it, it looked like, well, why would you put an option in that literally nobody wanted? And the reason was because when you took it out, nobody wanted to go for or fewer people wanted to get by the, the more expensive option and the one that the economist wanted to sell. So the point of this is, and some people call it decoy pricing, but it's, it's thinking a bit more cleverly, which is, well, what happens if I give people only two options? So if I do a social media post and I'm trying to get people to buy what I'm selling, what happens if I give them only two options? And there's quite a bit of research suggests, well, if you only give them two options, the brain will come up with the third one, which is I'll not bother, thanks very much. I'll go for yeah. the cheaper one. And so also, um, they think they've got a really good deal there, don't they? Yeah. Because they're getting both to the same price as... So, so yeah. but they only, they only went for the good deal if you introduced that third option. Yeah. Which was, again, that differentiator. So, so it, it seems it seems like from a brain point of view, there is a magic number of options to present, which is at least three. Okay. And, it, and even if one of those options on the first of it go, well, that doesn't make any sense at all, what it might do is it might be driving potential, pe potential customers to take the option that you actually do want. Yeah. And again, it's about understanding, well, how do we react to these things from a brain point of view? And... Why do we prefer that number of options to that number? Yeah. And that's really interesting. I could honestly speak to you all day, Mike. <laughs> so if anyone's got any questions before we finish the live stream, do, do put them, any more questions, do pop them in the chat. But, I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating, isn't it, the way the brain works and how we can use that in our marketing. And... And actually what you've talked about today are actually quite simple tweaks, aren't they? But yeah. things that we probably wouldn't even think about. Yeah, anybody who's uh, got it in for this afternoon or, or over the next week or so, and they think, I'm going to put some, some social media posts out, I want to write some copy, balance your language patterns off, think about how, how easy am I making this for people to read it, and if I'm going to put some pricing options or options in there for anything, how many do I need to put in, and what do they look like? And just because you've got two that... Uh, different offerings but the same price that it, it's worth doing a bit of a b test and say well what happens if i do put that in uh, and and take a leaf out the economist magazine's yeah. uh, subscription model yeah and, oh, and wow. if there are any questions then you know feel free to get in touch to connect on linkedin and uh and visit salestraining.card.co where there's a a lot of free resources there there's no email grab it genuinely is free You've got, and I've had a look, there are loads of resources, so I will put a link in the chat. And if anyone's watching this on catch up as well, please do put any more questions because we will come back and answer them. And also what I will do is I'll find um, that TED talk that you mentioned, Mike, as well, because that would be really, really useful um, as well. Um, I'll pop that in the chat as well. And if there are any of our social flock members watching, I'll put a link to that TED talk in our Facebook group as well. So. A huge thank you, Mike. It's been really fascinating. And I think we'll just have to have you on another live stream at some point to talk about and really delve into some more of these really interesting insights because they do massively help to sell and market your business on social media, don't they? And really connect with your you with your target market. So thank you. Thank you so no, thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Bex. Really it's enjoyed been, it. Good. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I will not be back next week. I'm actually in Blackpool with it being half term, taking the kids to Blackpool. That should be fun. And uh, yes, but I will be back in another couple of weeks where I will be uh, sharing some more tips and advice on social media. So thanks everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed this, please do give us a thumbs up. Again, if you're watching on Catch Up, ask us any questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please do subscribe to my channel or follow me on Facebook or connect with us on LinkedIn. Mike's very active on LinkedIn as well. So uh, yes, thanks everyone and have a great week. Bye.